Okay, so today's vi video is going to be on viruses. In particular, we're going to focus a lot on the structure of the virus today. Okay, so as you can see here, we've got some virus samples. All three of these are samples of a virus. Uh, if you look at them, they're significantly different than a cell. Okay, they look different. Uh, they have different components than a cell. Um, so what we're going <coughs> to what we're going to talk about first is some characteristics of living things. Because we need to come to determination as to whether viruses are considered non-living or they are considered a living organism. Okay, so which one are they? So let's take a look at some characteristics of living things to try to help make that determination. Okay, so there are five basic characteristics of living things that we are going to focus on. Okay, and so the first one is going to be that all of our living things are going to be made up of cells. Okay, if y'all remember down here we've got some samples of cells. Okay, down here. Okay, so I've got a plant cell here on the side. Okay, this one over here hopefully you realize is an animal cell. And then the other two are both prokaryotic cells. Okay, or bacterial cells. Okay, and so they're significantly, they're, but they're all different. They have different components. Remember, our prokaryotic cells don't have membrane-bound organelles, but our eukaryotic cells, our plant and our animal cell, do have membrane-bound organelles. Um, but they remember, they all have those same four components. They have to have a cell membrane. They have to have a genetic material, in particular DNA. Okay? They have to have cytoplasm. They have to have ribosomes. All, cells have to have all of those things to be classified as a cell. Remember, cell is, cells are also considered our smallest unit of living things. Okay? So, um, <coughs> so when we look at a virus and we look at its structure, you're going to see it's going to be missing a few of these things um, as to be part of what's considered a cell. Okay? Another characteristic of living things is that they are able to do metabolism. They're able to metabolize nutrients. This we have going on over here. Okay, take doing um, cellular respiration okay, and other photosynthesis, other chemical reactions that are going to allow them to metabolize nutrients and use nutrients. Okay. Another characteristic of our living things is that they have the ability to reproduce. Okay, and they have the ability to reproduce all by themselves. Okay, they don't need... Um, another organism or anything like that to help them be able to reproduce. Okay? And you'll see that viruses, they're going to need a host cell to be able to reproduce. So our first three things we've got here is that living things need to be made up of cells. Remember, that's our smallest characteristic. Um, that's our smallest unit of life. And remember, to be a cell, it's going to have to have a, all cells, eukaryotic or prokaryotic, have a cell membrane, they have cytoplasm, they have ribosomes, and they have DNA. Okay. It can do um, metabolism, okay. it can metabolize nutrients or essentially do uh, chemical reactions, okay. and they can reproduce on their own. In addition to uh, those three characteristics of life, okay, we also have that they're going to contain genetic material in the form of DNA. Okay, remember, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Okay, it is made up of those nucleotides. Um, it carries the genetic uh, information inside the sequence of those nitrogen bases there in the middle. Okay, so living things um, have to have that genetic material in the form of DNA. Now remember, it doesn't have to be contained in a nucleus. They just have to have DNA. Okay. They also, living things also have the ability to maintain homeostasis. Okay. And by maintaining homeostasis, they can do things like um, balance water. They can regulate body temperature. Okay. They can um, do certain chemical reactions that'll, that allow their body to maintain at that steady rate so they're able to balance out their water, their nutrients, their energy. Okay, and again you'll see that viruses don't really do that. Okay, so we've kind of touched on some of the things that viruses cannot do, okay, and some of the reasons why they would be considered non-living. Okay, so 
based on those five characteristics of life, the first one is that they have to be made up of cells. Okay, that does not equal a cell. Okay, it, it doesn't have a cell membrane, it doesn't have ribosomes, it doesn't have cytoplasm. It may or may not have DNA. It may have RNA instead of DNA. Okay, so it doesn't, <coughs> excuse me, it's not made up of cells. Okay, it is, um, viruses don't really do chemical reactions. Okay, so they're not really doing this metabolism here. When they reproduce, they require a host. Okay, you can see the green virus here okay, going inside the cell, using the parts of the cell to make new viruses. And when they reproduce and that cell releases the, those viruses, it actually kills that host cell. So for a virus to be able to reproduce, it cannot do that on its own. It requires a host cell. Okay, um, the fourth one was that it contained DNA for genetic material. And like I said, they may or may not have DNA. They may have RNA instead of DNA. Okay, and then also to be able to maintain homeostasis, you need to be able to do, as a general rule, you need to be able to do some chemical reactions. And viruses don't do that. They don't have anything to do chemical reactions with. Okay, so now that we've been looking at how the viruses can... <coughs> as a general rule, considered non-living. Let's take a closer look at their structure. Okay, so viruses basically contain two parts. Okay, they're going to contain some genetic material. Sorry, the iPad fell over. So they're going to contain some genetic material, and they're going to contain a capsid. Now remember, this genetic material can be either DNA or RNA. They do not have to have DNA. They can be a DNA virus or they can be an RNA virus. For example, HIV is an RNA virus. Okay? It does not contain any DNA. Um, let's see. And then wrapped around that DNA, they're going to contain a protein capsid. If y'all remember this, capsid was one of our vo vocabulary words. I uh, said it resembled the word capsule, which is true. All right, you can see this protein coat, this protein coat, this protein capsid surrounding the DNA or the RNA that is found in the virus. And that's about it. Okay, they're, structurally, the virus is not overly complicated. Okay, the capsid can have a variety of shapes. So um, let's take a look at some of those shapes that the capsid could be in. Okay, so the capsid, as a general rule, they're usually either helical. Okay, so like that would be an example of a helical one, or they are isohedral. You'll see these a lot in geometry, these three-dimensional shapes like that. So uh, most of them, like I said, are uh, helical or isohedral. This one over here on the side that looks kind of like a combination of the two, that's what's called a bacteriophage. Okay. And a bacteriophage is a virus, okay? but remember what phage is? To eat, so it's eating bacteria. So a bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. And for a virus, it has a complicated structure. Okay, so bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. Um, as a general rule, they look like this. Okay, uh, they look like giant kind of spider bug things that land on the bacteria and insert their genetic material into the bacterial cell for reproduction purposes. Okay, so remember your bacteria here, because we're going to be talking a lot about viruses versus bacteria. Um, your bacteria are cells. They are prokaryotic, so the viruses can use them to reproduce, and they can infect them, and they can invade them. Okay? And remember, all your bacteria are not bad, so you can have a virus that is affecting your good bacteria, and so even though it's not directly infecting you, it's affecting the good bacteria inside of your body, and that can have an impact on you. In addition to a capsid, some viruses, definitely not all, but some viruses may have a viral envelope. Okay, and a viral envelope is an extra, essentially an extra coating around the outside of the virus. You can see it here in this virus. Okay, here's our main, our capsid, and our um, genome inside of the virus. <coughs> Excuse me. 
and then it is surrounded by that envelope. And that envelope is actually going to be made of cell membrane because that envelope is going to have come from the host cell. So when this host cell here has opened up and let the virus out, as the virus is pushed through the cell membrane, they pick up pieces of the cell membrane. Okay? And so they end up with this extra coating, this viral envelope that is going to resemble the cell membrane, which can have an impact on its ability to infect other cells. Other cells may not as quickly recognize the virus as being infectious because it is covered in this envelope and they may mistake it for a regular cell. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna look at structurally on the virus are what are called surface markers. Okay, and most of your viruses will have some sort of surface marker, and um, they are similar, not the same, but similar to the uh, antigens that we talked about, like on blood cells, where they had those surface markers so that the antibodies um, knew whether it was a foreign blood cell or not. Okay, so your viruses have these surface markers, and the surface markers help the virus determine what cell it can infect. These surface markers are what enable the virus to be able to bond to a host cell, to be able to find a host cell that it's able to invade. Like you can see the surface markers on this virus. Okay, if you look over here, we've got a virus here with these surface markers. This is a potential cell over here. This cell has surface markers on it that fit into the virus receptors. So this virus can infect this host cell. Okay, if you think about it, um, think about it in the terms when you get sick. Okay, most of you have had um, a cold virus. Okay, so the common cold is a virus. And so that cold virus, that's going to infect um, a lot of uh, nasal cells, respiratory passage cells, but it does not infect your stomach cells. Okay, you don't feel sick to your stomach when you have a cold. And that's because they're the, stomach, the cells in your stomach and in your intestines don't have receptors that match up with that cold virus. The cold virus matches up with those receptors that are located inside the respiratory passageways and those cells that are inside your respiratory passageways. Okay, so that's our basic structure of a virus. Um, next time we'll be talking about how the virus is going to reproduce and then we'll continue on a little bit more with certain kinds of infectious diseases.